Several years ago in Vietnam, there was an area just adjacent to the property of Company of Grace, which is the area where Wah Stone has developed the service centre for children with a disability. And the person who sold the land to Company of Grace was a general. He was a general in the South Vietnamese army and he was a very rich man and he built this incredible large mansion and it was just adjacent to the property of Company of Grace. And the river is just beyond, so it's a beautiful riverfront property that he built. And it was going to be a magnificent structure. And it had various things to be developed, of course, and um, the land was to be cleared, and all this was happening as they were building the property. As you can see, large sides, back area, front portico, and so on, and standing on um, a large concrete base or brick base there. But this is what happened. Uh, about 18 months ago, I went back and the house had sunk into the river. The whole area where it was on, this area here, slid down and where it was became river. So the general had put his house on a strong foundation, but the foundation had not gone into the ground. Those bricks you see, they, they were sitting on the sand. And so the house just fell into the river. A very tragic outcome. Um, that whole area is now a river, whereas it was land. Of course, we were hoping that the Company of Grace would not slide down with it because it wasn't far away. But Company of Grace, we had put pylons down 30 metres down the ground to hit the bedrock. And the Company of Grace stood and the general's house fell into the river and uh, that was a very very difficult time for the general and of course he thought the spirits were against him and so on but essentially he had not built his house upon the rock and it reminded me of this um, incredible story um, from the scripture in Matthew chapter 7 verse 24 where we read about the man who built his house upon the sand. So if you have your Bibles or you've got your phones or your tabs or whatever you have, um, have a look at this particular passage. Otherwise, just listen as I read it out. Matthew 7, verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them, hears and acts, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall. Now, life is like this. Life has the rains come, the floods rise, the winds of adversity hit. And when that happens in our Christian lives, when we have opposition come, or problems arise, or we feel vulnerable, we need to have our lives built upon the rock because it says here, it did not fall because it had been founded upon the rock. You see, the issue in life is not that the winds are bad or that the adversity is something that should not be. That, that will happen. The winds will come, the rains will come, the flood will come. That's not the issue. The issue is, are you built upon the rock? Do you have a solid foundation upon which you can stand when the adversity comes and strikes you? Now, Jesus goes on and says, And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man. So here's the contrast. The wise man built his house upon the rock, but the foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the truth is the general was a foolish man in this literal context here. He built his house on the sand, didn't take notice of the structure rules, a very, very vulnerable piece of sand indeed, right near the river in uh, Vietnam. 
The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall. Now here it wasn't even the wind and the rain and the floods that came, it was just that the house was built on very unsettled ground and great was the fall. And so it's the situation of life that if we don't build our house upon the rock, if our foundations aren't firm, then great will be the fall. But those whose house is built upon the foundation of Christ, the rock, then they will be strong. Now, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not like the scribes. So here was Jesus giving this parable, this wonderful teaching to them, and the crowd were astonished at what he was saying. He was speaking not like anyone else they had ever heard speak. He had authority, not like the scribes who simply went to their law statements. And this particular passage, this particular parable, if you look in your Bible, you'll see it is the last part of the Sermon on the Mount. Right back from the earlier part in the chapter 5 where the Beatitudes are given, those beautiful attitudes, those ethics of the kingdom, the principles for kingdom living, that goes right through from chapter 5. It talks about anger and divorce and oaths and retaliation, love for the enemies, alms giving, prayer, gives very many things about rules and practices for ethical Christian living, fasting, treasures, how our eyes should be, serving masters, not to worry, judging others, the pr profaning the holy name, ask, search and knock is that principle, the golden rule, the narrow gate of the tree and its fruit, self-deception and so on. That's what came before Jesus saying, everyone who hears these words of mine. So that statement, everyone who hears these words of mine were his sermon that he's just preached. All of the ethics of the kingdom, all of the principles of living the Christian life. And he uses this parable to sum it all up and say, everyone who hears everything I've just said is like a wise man who builds his house upon the rock. And one of the words that comes out over and over and over here is the word to do. Everyone who hears these and acts on them, that's the word poin, to do. When you do that, you are like a man who built his house upon the rock. So Jesus is now coming from what we could say theory to practice. He's outlined the principles. He's given full detail about the ethics of the kingdom. And now he's coming and saying, that's not enough. It's not enough to be a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word. The key thing for Christian life is to do. And if we come along even to church and we're simply hearers of the word and not doers of the word, then Jesus says we are like a person who builds the house upon the sand. And when the adversity comes, if we're not serving and sharing and doing and acting out the word of God, when the tough winds blow and the rain comes and the flood rises, we're going to be like the man who built his house upon the sand. So this is an important passage. We often hear this in a Sunday school story, but the point is this is the summation of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, we also read about this in Luke chapter 6, verse 46. And the interesting thing is that this talks about foundations as well. So listen to Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them. That one is like a man building a house who dug deeply and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood arose, the river burst against the house but could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built his house on the ground without a foundation, like the general did here. When the river burst against it, how true to this one, the river, 
it immediately fell, and great was the ruin of that house. You know, this is virtually a little tag to the general's house. Uh, it's an incredibly close verse. Now, this particular passage isn't the Sermon on the Mount, it's the Sermon on the Plain. So Jesus gave a Sermon on the Mount, and he gave a Sermon on the Plain, and here he's giving a slightly different uh, interpretation to this parable. Remember, it's a parable. It's not necessarily a true story. It is a story about a man. Jesus may have referenced it to something, but it's a parable. And Jesus is giving a little bit of a difference here, and it seems it might be because there's a different audience. The Greeks understood about good buildings and foundations, and they would understand putting your foundations down deeply. So this focus is on the foundations being deep. Not so much about the location. The other one is about the man built his house upon the rock. This is putting a deep foundation down. And this is what the uh, Greeks understood well, about a deep foundation. The Jews were more um, not aware of that, that they weren't so much the structure builders, but they understood the location. Oh, built on the sand, built on the rock. And so here is another example of the importance. But what Jesus is stressing in both of those, on the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain here, is that you need a strong foundation. And the wise person, remembering that the passage from Matthew was after the Beatitudes, after the Sermon on the Mount, the person who is wise is the one who will do the words that I've spoken. And so as we come to um, the end of this year, we have had a year where we have particularly looked about what, it, what is it to follow Jesus? And essentially, one of the crucial things to understand is to follow Jesus is to have our foundation upon the rock. And so I wonder how we're going in all of that. How are we outworking our lives? And particularly as we are understanding the types of people who respond. Now in Matthew, we saw at the start of the year, as we looked at two types of responses, they're the same as this response here. There's the Matthew type responses and then there's the rich young ruler type response. There are two houses, one built on the rock, one built on the sand. There are two responses and builders, one who builds the house on the rock, one who builds the house on the sand. Um, we see other metaphors like the sheep and the wolves and so on. We see Jesus giving this contrast all the way through. But here, at the start of the year, we looked at what it is to follow Jesus. That's our theme. And in Matthew, we saw that when Jesus said, follow me, Matthew got up, it says, straight away, and followed him. Matthew left what he was doing, and we read to the other disciples, left their nets and followed Jesus. According to this context here, they were wise. They left the shaky foundation of money, material gain and left their nets that was their livelihood behind that they dropped that not that they didn't go back to that from time to time for getting resources but that wasn't the priority they left their nets this was the wise response they were not building their foundation upon the sinking sand of money or possessions they were building upon the rock that Jesus said come follow me and when we think of the rock the Bible also says when um, Jesus was thinking about the church and then when Paul was writing about the church it was build your life upon the rock Peter was the rock foundation in the sense that he said I trust in Jesus Christ the living one he's the foundation of my life and Jesus said upon that rock like statement Peter I'm going to build my church the wise person is the person who follows after Jesus fully and places his life upon the rock they left their nets, they left the sinking sand type of living and trusted Jesus who was the rock. And sometimes they had to place their head upon a rock because Jesus said, um, you, if you're going to follow me, you won't necessarily have a place to lay your head. So there was a cost to following Jesus. It wasn't easy. It, it meant something. They had to give something up to follow him. And... So Matthew gives us the beautiful response of how to follow Jesus. The contrast was the rich young ruler who in Mark 10, 21 to 22, 
the rich young ruler wants to follow Jesus. Uh, he wants to be part of what Jesus is doing. And he asks Jesus, how can it be that I can gain eternal life? How can I be your follower? And Jesus looked at him, Mark 10, 21, and felt love towards him and said, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But at these words, the young man was saddened and he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. You see, the rich young ruler had his investment on the sand. He didn't want to come to the rock because he had so much built. And like the general, it looked good. It was something that he had security in, but it was not on the rock. He went away sorrowful. and We don't really hear what happened to him after that. But Jesus knew it's better for you, young man, to sell all you have and give it to the poor than to be on this vulnerable sand type living. So to follow Jesus is to follow the rock, that Jesus himself is the rock. Though you may have nothing and you may have little earthly security, as you follow him, you have everything. And that's the challenge of being one who follows Jesus. And so the question at the start of the year was, which one of these are we? Are we the wise or the foolish? And it can be that even in church we can be foolish. Uh, we can follow Jesus from afar. We can follow him from Sunday living and not follow him through the week. We can study about him but not follow his words. We can watch about him on television but not put what he says into practice. It is possible to know Jesus from a distance that's building your life upon the sand. But if you were to build your life on the rock, you're following Jesus closely and clinging to him, standing by him, knowing that he is the stability of life. So we've heard this call over and over through the year. Everything we've said from this platform has been tagged to that sense, will you follow Jesus? And in Matthew 7.20, just before this particular passage about those who hear my words, Jesus said, by your fruits you will know them. And so I can say with authority from the word of God that as we come to the end of 2.18, we, we've laid out the challenge about follow Jesus. And by your fruit you will know whether you have taken up the challenge to be a one who follows Jesus with your feet upon the rock of Christ. How have you gone in 2018? What do you notice now that distinguishes you as a follower of Jesus, as distinct from maybe at the start of the year when you first thought of this theme? We gave out some key indicators, and today you have those key indicators with you in your handout. So I wonder if you can take them out now. Uh, please take it out and have a look. It's a little little shape like this, an A5 size bit of paper. And on there, it has the very same things that I handed out at the start of the year in February. And this morning, I'm just wanting to think about how we've gone and how you would estimate that you've gone this year in moving from an awareness of Jesus to being one who has your feet upon the rock. So the sort of things that we had talked about, the first one was, do you believe in him? Do you believe in him? And so I wonder in this area, um, as we say, follow, this was the response of um, the young man in Matthew, follow me, and he did. And that's the other response about the rich young ruler. And Jesus said to them, you know, why do you call me Lord, but don't do what I said? So here's the key thing, to do what he says. And by the fruit we'll know. So as you look upon this and look at the fruit of your life over this last year, what do you notice? Firstly, do you believe in him? And I'm just wanting to provide an opportunity now, in the 10 minutes we have left, for us to respond on this. 
Uh, it might be that as you look at each of these, there's something that you can say, yes, there's been a, a shift there. There's been a change. There's been something in my life that I can detect. A and if we can't, well, maybe I'm not saying this for you to go away sorrowful and head down, but maybe take this as a motivation to say, well, there comes a time where we don't just hear the word of God, we do it. And we need to be responders and people who take action. So here was a way for you to measure that. So for some very significant ones, do you believe in him? And I wonder for someone today, is there any area where you have come to believe more deeply in Jesus, where your trust in him has grown? Has there been an experience over the year where something has caused you to have a greater sense of belief in Jesus? Uh, he's moved more from just a theological concept to be a very real person in your life. And so we're just going to have a mic available. Yes, I think everyone will probably relate. It's not new what I'm going to say. But um, listening to secular truth or truth that you hear from friends and family, media, uh, alternative persuasions in um, the world, that hasn't robbed me of any trust and faith and belief in Jesus. It's hearing, we hear now more, more of this type of stress and um, contraindication truth to our own value system and our own belief. It's more and more. We see it everywhere, we hear it, it's in our families. And, but it hasn't denied and robbed me of any trust. It's actually increased my trust in Jesus. Mm, great. It is the case that as the world throws at us all sorts of alternative perspectives, it actually can be a moment for you to measure that and say, no, no, I'm going to stand upon the rock. Um, that's not going to throw me. I'm going to stay believing in Jesus. Anyone else on that particular area? I've really found over the year that I can trust Jesus far more than I ever have. I think when problems arise, I've always been the worrier and tried to do something myself, but I've found that I can go to Jesus and rest in him and knowing mm. whatever the outcome, he's in charge. So it's been a good year. Mm. It is good to learn to trust on, in the rock. Um, whatever the winds and adversity is blowing, that's one thing, isn't it? but um, we are safe in Christ and we've said it over and over, it's not the end of the story. Whatever happens now, there's still a not yet and we can be confident in Jesus. Anyone else on this one? This year has been particularly difficult with all sorts of things going on, but at times I've just been absolutely bereft of energy and mm. I have just cried out to God and asked him for his strength and repeated the words from Isaiah that he is my help and mm. he is my strength mm. and he will uphold me. And I have proved that over and over and over mm. again. Mm. Well, that's a wonderful thing. He is my strength and that's the rock. And so as we continue on with these, you'll see you were baptised. Here's another indicator of choosing to follow Jesus. So... Again, today, uh, I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up and respond to baptism, but I would like to encourage you that part of being one who follows Jesus is that you follow his command to be baptised. And uh, this year, we, we actually haven't seen anyone take that step of baptism. I think that's the first year we haven't seen someone put up their hand to be baptised. And I trust that's because there's been learning and growing and thinking, but... I'm encouraging you to take a step of baptism. If you haven't followed Jesus through the waters of baptism, maybe you're a believer, you're here, you've had a long journey with Jesus, you believe in him, but Jesus said be baptised. And this is part of our obedience to him, our com following his command. And it's part of standing upon the rock too. So if you haven't been baptised, I'd love you to talk to me about that. And don't take this big break and think, oh, I won't approach John. I'd love to hear from you. Just say it to me at the door or contact me and we'll follow that up because I'm sure there are people here who could respond to this challenge and this command to be baptised. What about this aspect of demonstrating um, 
and learning more and demonstrating a changed life. Sometimes we follow Jesus, but there's not a lot of difference. Um, But to follow Jesus means I learn all I can about him and actually something looks different now. And I wonder over the last year, can you point out anything in your life that you'll say, yes, actually, this is different. There is something different about what I'm doing now on the basis of that I follow Jesus. And this is where the rubber hits the road in many respects because this is the bit about the parable. Don't just hear the word of God, but do it. So what is it that you are doing perhaps? What is it that you have taken action on? What is it that you're now thinking? What is different in your life as a result of a sharper understanding of what it means to follow Jesus? Well, 12 months ago, I was seeking God to know what his plan for me was. And by plan, I mean... Where did he want me to work? And so I was praying, Lord, please show me your plan. And one thing I learned is we have to be careful what we pray for Mm. because sometimes God answers it in different Mm. ways to what we expect. Over the next couple of months, I learned that God did have a plan for me and that plan was for me to honour him and bring him glory. And that, I thought, no, but... Where am I to work in that? How, what, what is my path mm. you want me to take? And so over continuing on from that, he took me through lessons on who I am in my identity and how I can trust him mm. and even of late how to be humble and what humility looks like in my life. And so through my devotions on the weekend, I'd I'd often write a few poems. Mm. And this morning I was reflecting back over some of the poems I'd written Mm. to the point where I sat down and wrote a poem this morning called Christ is My Rock. Oh, wow. There you go. How's that? How's that? They had no idea what I was preaching on today. No idea. Well, and that is a very beautiful example, isn't it, of... Where have you seen a difference? And you've indicated that so clearly there. There's actually a difference that's happened in my life, understanding what it means to follow Jesus. Beautiful. Anything else on that one? Um, One of the things that I've been doing over the last few years is being a part of the KYB group that Mm. meets here at the church once a fortnight. And in the KYB group, we're given homework that we do in preparation for the um, study so we're really looking into the word and answering questions and then we meet together and share our responses and for me that's probably the um, the greatest growing in the word mm. that I do through that commitment. Um, we're a small group and there's room for more people to join us if others feel that that would be a way that they would like to have that sort of imposed discipline yeah. for learning mm. I really recommend it and mm. I know our group would welcome them. Mm, Beautiful. Um, The life of a small group helps us to understand and be more accountable and to learn together because we are called into community, not alone. And so time's really moving on. So have a look at these. You demonstrate a changed life. You demonstrate change of priorities. Uh, Is there anything you've noticed? We won't have time now to ask this, Um, but... But is there anything that you have seen that has been a change of priorities? Now, when Matthew was called, he left what he was doing, got up and followed Jesus. When the disciples were called, they left their nets and followed Jesus. What have you left in terms of your attachments and priorities? And what have you now seen as a new priority? And that is to follow Jesus with his word and his way. Not just to be a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. That action orientation. Where do you notice that? I'd encourage you to write it down on that little sheet. Reflect back on the year and say, where is it that I've noticed a priority shift? And if you don't notice anything, push into that. Even talk to someone and work it through. Because we are not to be hearers of the word. We are to be doers of the word. We are to be responders to what it means to follow Jesus. Now, have a look at these others as we close. You serve in some way. Now, are you active in service in some way? Because if you're not active in service, then in a sense you are hearing the word but not serving. 
And so there may be some reasons why you can't, and that's understandable, so I'm not seeking to judge, but I'm saying, how are you serving in some way? Um, the body only can operate as people serve. And uh, as we come up to a new year, there's all sorts of areas of service that are called for. So how are you serving? We're not saved to sit, we are saved to serve, and we find our best self as we serve. Where are you surrendering in some way to his kingdom purposes? Where you say, God, as Rick Warren well says, it's not about me. And Max Licato, in his beautiful little book about um, um, who am I, he says, it's not my focus, that's the crucial thing, it's who I am in Christ. So who are you and what have you surrendered to in some way to line up with his kingdom purposes? Have you begun to give more? Did you give to the thank offering because you had a sense of this is not what I own, it's what God owns and I give? Where are you noticing that you are surrendering in some way? What are you sacrificing for his kingdom's sake? You know, is it just easier to coast along and follow Jesus? Well, it's not what it was like in the New Testament. Some people lost their lives, some people lost their friends, they lost their associations. And today, if we are to be those who call Jesus Lord, it may cost us something. It may cost us a a comment by someone to say, oh, that's not very nice. We're living in a world now where the world has captured what it is to be nice. Um, And I I saw on the back, in the whole same-sex debate, they had on the back of the T-shirt, love thy neighbour. And so that movement has taken on the call to be those who love our neighbour, making the church to be the people who are unlovely. So the world is very, very... Um, subtly taking the place of being the nice ones but what are we giving up and sacrificing and taking opposition about if we're following Jesus we're standing firm on some things are you sharing some way what it means to follow Jesus have you opened your mouth and heart and hands and shown something about what it means to follow Jesus does someone know that you follow Jesus. You know, again, don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. Are you suffering in some way for his cause? That goes back to the area of sacrifice too. If you've sacrificed something up, you may be also following Jesus and finding a degree of um, judgment upon you or a degree of ridicule or a degree of accusation that you're not a loving person, for example. What are you suffering for, for his cause? And are you growing more like Jesus in character? Are you noticing that your life is wanting more of the purity of the life of Jesus? You're wanting more of his ethics to be part of your life. And are you challenging non-kingdom values? You know, are you saying, no, that is not right. I can discern between right and wrong. That's sand living, not rock living. And uh, I'm going to challenge those values and I'm going to stand upon the rock of Christ so all these aren't aren't just words that what I've got before you I trust is an evaluation tool something where you can say yes these are I can work on this more find a mentor talk in your small group a little bit like we heard Daryl speak about and um, Judy and you know what is it that I can strengthen on as I follow Jesus please help me ask your group help me be accountable for these outcomes So that as you move into next year, you're going to move into a more strengthened year. So as I talk about next year now, we've had a three-year focus on Jesus. The third year is next year. The first year, 2017, our theme was Jesus. I remember Derek and I speaking about what we're going to do in 2017. And as we talked about it, um, the sense was Jesus. (laughs) What better theme than Jesus? Okay, so we looked at who is Jesus? What are his claims? What is the uniqueness of his character? We looked at Jesus. And then this year, we took up that aspect, well, it isn't just Jesus we need to know about, we need to follow Jesus. So that became why we did this year on follow Jesus. And we've looked at a whole range of things in terms of what it means to follow Jesus. I trust that as we've talked about this last little bit now, you'll sense some of what we've talked about this year. 
And I'd love to, my last year as your senior pastor, I'm going to focus on Jesus is Lord. Jesus, follow him. Why? Why should we follow him? Because Jesus is Lord. And what does it mean that he is Lord? So that's going to be the focus next year as we really tease this out. Lord of my life, Lord of my priorities. When Jesus Christ came and the disciples followed him, they were in a context of competing values. Caesar was Lord. And they said, we do not acknowledge Caesar as Lord, we acknowledge Jesus as Lord. And it cost them their lives. So we are going to look next year, what does it mean to follow Jesus as Lord? And I trust this will be a great year as we understand that together. I want to close with this little passage from Acts chapter 17. It's about a time when the uh, disciples were um, doing great things and sharing in a marvellous way in the cities. And it comes from Acts 17. But when they, hostile Jews that is, did not find them, that is Paul, who was preaching Christ, they dragged Jason, who was helping out, and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These would have turned the world upside down, and they have come here too. And Jason has received them, that is Paul and his followers, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king. Equal sign, <laughs> next year's theme. So Jason was dragged before the religious rulers and the other authorities because he was helping Paul and helping all that he was doing. And they said, these people have turned things upside down. And why? Because they are serving another king, Caesar. Not you, another king. And it strikes me that this is the call to make Jesus Lord. We serve another king. Not the king of our self, not the king of our money, not the king of our prestige or power, not the king of the moral patterns of the world, but Jesus is king. He is Lord. And we're going to look at the early church that challenged to follow Jesus as Lord there. And I trust it brings something to bear on our lives as we go into next year and follow him as Lord. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this year. We thank you for the way you have led us and what we have learnt. Father, we ask your Holy Spirit might continue to work in our hearts and minds and our behaviours so that this hasn't been just a year where we've looked on the Scriptures, but that the Scriptures have impacted us and we've taken action. Thank you for the poin word that talks about to do. And Jesus said, he who hears these words of mine and does them is the wise man who built his house upon the rock. Help us as we go today to be wise people, making wise choices and choosing to follow Jesus and acknowledge him as rightful Lord of life. We pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.